Welcome back. I'm here with Nikki. Nikki, what do you do for a living? An escort. <laughs> An escort? Mm -hmm. Escort and prostitute, what's the difference? Um, I don't know. In my I don't know, experience, I've learned like prostitute is more like when you're on the streets. Um, escort, it's more, I guess, when you're posting or work for an agency, stuff like that. That's my opinion, anyway. I mean, I think that's that's what it is. But. Is that what the loophole to prostitution thing? No, I think um, I don't know. I mean, times where I've sometimes it's just easier to pop outside and go, you know, do a couple dates or something, whatever. I don't know. Then Talk go through the like right. Then go through like the hassle of having to go through all the you know text messages, phone calls, and because most of it when you post, it's like you do have to go through you know, for every hundred text messages or phone calls, you know, that you weed through, there's going to be the one or the two that you get. It's fine. But most of your time is spent on the phone texting and, you know, talking to people like that. Because there's a lot of weirdos out there. There's a lot of people that just, you know, are bullshitting. Some people just want, they, they're trying to con you into sending pictures. There's people out there that have scams. So it's, there's a lot of stuff to weed. There's, you know, vice, stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff to weed through. So. Fair enough, fair enough. Sometimes it's just easy to say, scroll that, pop outside and whatever. But. The thing with that is you're not going to be able to, usually not going to be able to command as much money on the street as you can posting, so. Fair enough. That's what I've learned. So I'll start from the beginning. Uh, where are you from originally? Originally from upstate New York. Um, pretty much grew up there. Uh, parents were, uh, they split up at some point. They ended up getting remarried years later, but we kind of, yeah. Uh, my mom was away for a while, so we grew up with my grandfather. <laughs> oh, oh and, yeah. Prison? Jail? Um, yeah, so... Uh, we didn't know that, though, until <laughs> we were a little bit older. Um, she was at the hospital. <laughs> but yeah, other than that... She was mm, at the hospital. Yeah. So, um, I guess, fast forward to... What about your father? He was here still. He was in Arizona. Basically, uh, we, had, we grew up there. Well, I'm sorry. We spent some time there, I should say. When I was very young, we ended up moving out here. Um, so my dad's family was all up here. He's from Sicily, and then all his family, like, everyone went to New York, and then his family ended up moving here, <laughs> because I guess, like, this was the place to move when you, if you had allergies and stuff like that. Oddly enough, I don't know. <laughs> Asthma, allergies, this was the place to be. Like, the air was so great, I guess. Anyways, um, they all moved here, and, I mean, there's still some sprinkled throughout upstate also, but he met my mother, and I guess they had me. <laughs> And they decided to come out here too. She was pregnant with my sister, and when they got out here, she ended up getting picked up. And um, I don't even know if I should talk about this. Actually, is there a way you can edit this out? <laughs> oh, we can. Because I don't know if it's a good. I don't know. She might get so mad if I talk about this. But anyways, that's how we ended up back in New York. My sister and I went back with her, and um, she was away for a while. My dad stayed here with his girlfriend. <laughs> so um, that's how they ended up splitting up. And we stayed with my grandfather, and he, he didn't like my dad. I mean, he's, he's passed on. But uh, pretty much told my mom if she comes out here to, to chase after him, then, you know, she's cut off. But she did that, so, and that's how they got back together. They got remarried, and they had my brother. So I have a little brother, too. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of, once they got remarried, it was all normal, you know, normal life. I mean, it was normal before that, too. It was just they were both kind of missing in action at the time. So, but, uh, so besides your mother being in jail, prison, you think you, your childhood was pretty, pretty normal? I mean, I feel like it was. My dad, that's one of his biggest things. He always feels bad with, like, my, you know, issue with addiction and stuff. He's like, I feel like you were subjected to so many things at such a young age. I always tell him it's my responsibility. You guys didn't do anything wrong. You guys did the best you could. I mean, I, I love my parents. I think they're the greatest. Um, but, yeah, they always, I don't know, that's what he always thinks. And he's like, oh, you know, you're, my brother, there's a huge age gap. He's, uh, let's see, 20, I think he's 30 now. So there's like 14, 15 year difference. Um, but totally different lifestyle. He, you know, knows them as being together. He doesn't know anything about anything. 
Um, he went to the same schools growing up. He had the same friends. He didn't move around. Um, very consistent. He doesn't know anything about addiction. He doesn't care to know anything about addiction. Um, and that's, yeah. So I guess there's a lot of differences there, but I, I don't know. I feel like I had a normal childhood, but I guess most people would probably beg to differ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I feel like I had a normal childhood and I, I had a lot of love. There was still a lot of love, regardless of what was going on or what was right or wrong, surrounded by love. So that's good. That's what I would sum that up as. <laughs> so let's go to the next step. So how were you in school? Good. I was excelled at everything, especially spelling and English and grammar and all that. Um, Actually, I was just telling my friend yesterday we were talking about spelling bees because she noticed my vocabulary and she's like, oh my gosh, you actually know words. I was like, yeah, I know. I guess sometimes I get like numb and you dumb yourself down depending on, <laughs> I hate to say that, but depending on who you're around. So we were joking saying like, I was like, yeah, I used to win spelling bees and stuff like that. But then as I got into like junior high, I was like embarrassed and wanted to be cool or whatever. So didn't really focus on it. And I was like, well, lo and behold, I could have won like scholarships and stuff, <laughs> you know, so yeah. Other than that, um, things were fine. I got to high school, and that was when I kind of started to party a little bit, smoke weed, whatever, drink. And I guess things were pretty normal. And then as I got to, like, my senior year, that's when things went. <laughs> How so? Explain. Um, I started doing speed, like, so that was, like, you know, partying. We're going to raves and doing all kinds of stuff. And The ecstasy. The ecstasy. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, that's some things went. It was actually my was it my junior year in high school. Yeah, we went just like, but it was all just partying, having a good time, whatever. You know, we didn't really think like of the ramifications of like that that's gonna affect us or could possibly affect us twenty years down the road. So, yeah. Did you finish uh, high school? Um, I no, I ended up getting my GED when I was pregnant with my son, like a year after that. So, yeah. Okay. I I made it up to my senior year. I think I only had like. I, don't know, I didn't even have a full schedule, and I was stupid. I left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was, yeah. So after high school, what's the what's the next step? Um, I ended up getting pregnant probably about a year after. I was nineteen, twenty, with my son. Um, I just you try to go to college. Yeah, I did. I went to MCC and Mesa Community College. Sorry. Um, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was just kind of going with you know my general the credits you know that you go for. And then um, at some point down the road, I decided to go for nursing because I figured it would be, you know, single mother. And I knew, like, my one cousin that I was talking about actually briefly earlier, she had done that, the travel nursing. And so she had moved, like, downstate into Manhattan. And, you know, I saw, like, how I was like, damn, you know, she's making great money and this, that, the other. And it just seemed like a good, stable career <laughs> for myself to be, like I said, as a single mother or whatever, and I knew I could be do it, like, I could be good at it, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, I switched um, over to do the prereqs for nursing and just continued working on that um, and raising my son. I worked, I was uh, not partying anymore, <laughs> just doing the normal, yeah. And how old are you at this time, more or less? Um, this was like 1920 and this lasted, I mean, yeah, pretty much through my 20s, early 30s. I was, I was, yeah, I mean, I'd go out and, like, casually drink and stuff like that, but um, for the most part, I was just uh, bartending. You know, I started off cocktailing, and then I was bartending, but I was in the, you know, service industry scene or whatever, and I made good money, and that was kind of how I segued into dancing, um, which, you know, I was still bartending, cocktailing, but then I was like, oh, you know, I could make extra money, even more money, even though I was doing fine. So I then... Yeah, I started dancing on the side, and then it was like, I eventually went over and, and ended up uh, being a cocktail waitress at the strip club I was working at, and then I would just kind of dance when I had, you know, off time or whatever, and had my own regulars, you know, I didn't need to dance all the time, but it was, yeah, it was awesome supplemental income. So, so who, who got you into dancing? Um, a really, really good friend of mine that I went to high school with, but he kind of, he was in, in the whole adult entertainment scene, like, well before anyone as a DJ and he kind of met everybody and knew everybody. So yeah, we were just out one night drinking. He's like, Oh, you know, you, you make a ton of money. And I was like, Oh no, 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 whatever. And one thing led to another. And next thing you know, I was on stage. <laughs> so just like that. Yeah. <laughs> it was, 
I mean, it was that that night, yeah. But then I saw, you know, everybody's throwing money, and I was like, a big light bulb went off. Like, oh my gosh, wow. And it is. There's like a little excitement to it, and yeah. So after that, I was like, all right, I could do this, <laughs> and I did for a while. Um, I'm trying to think, that lasted. I guess it was into like. Yeah, into my, like, early 30s, I'd say. So, yeah. I don't know if he's... Can you see him or... Okay. <laughs> yeah, it was into my early 30s, I'd say. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, you started dancing. Any any crazy experiences dancing? No, it was just fun. It was a blast. I mean, the club that I worked at, like I said, I, I, I was like a waitress. I would cocktail waitress from, like... I had a set schedule that I worked Monday through Friday because, you know, I also had my son and everything too. So I was still able to be like, you know, chaperoning field trips and <laughs> making sure I was, you know, waking up to get him off to school, picking him up, whatnot. Granted, my family helped out a lot with that too, um, you know, at times because I worked a lot. I worked, you know, like I said, my regular schedule, but then I would go in and dance here and there on my, my off shifts because I just got addicted to making money. And that's what essentially happens. You just get addicted to like, oh my gosh, you know, like... You go in. You, it was fast money. Yeah, I'd had days off, and I'm like, oh, I could be, I could make like seven. I'm making seven hundred dollars right now, or thought, you know, whatever. So, but you know, money comes and goes, and it seems like the more money you make, it seems like you have the, the more expenses you have, or something. I don't know. So, yeah, but um, dance in a typical night. What do you think you'd make? I pretty much stayed to make. I mean, it was never like, if I went in on a shift, I would be like, okay, today I have to make five hundred. And then once I made that, I would leave. Okay. You know, well, once you make all your stuff, you got to tip everyone out and stuff like that too. Pay the house, but that's essentially how I would make my. Okay, well, I'm going to make this much. I mean, there were times I'd go in. Oh my god, I made like eighteen hundred dollars. Like you know, eighteen hundred dollars in a night. Yeah, you know. So and that's like, oh whoa, you know, cool. Um, especially if you have regulars and stuff. You know, I had a few that would come in to town and okay here. Um, if there's special events and stuff like that and everybody's all rowdy, then yeah, it just depends. But um, on average, I mean, I did good. I did fine. I did good just waitressing, cocktail waitressing. And then I worked there for like, I'd say about six years, maybe. Something like that, yeah. And I had left another bar where I had been cocktailing and bartending, but it was more of a sports bar. I worked there for like five or six years. Um, and I had actually stopped going to school for, um, I left MCC, I thought, for a semester. I was going to go back and finish my nursing, but I ended up going to esthetician school and getting my, you know, to work skincare, waxing and stuff like that. And um, ended up doing that, getting my license doing that. And that was kind of coincided with my schedule. I mean, it worked and I, and I enjoyed doing it. Like, I even want to go back to renew my license and do that because I miss doing it. Some normalcy there. <laughs> and I was good at it, like I said. So, yeah. But that's all I, I mean, I, then it was like, I don't know, this whole lifestyle didn't really start until I was, like, had relapsed back into, like, the drug world again and was, like, you know, estranged from my family and, yeah, so. I don't know. So, so what age did you get back into, into the drug life? Um, I was actually, the odd thing was is I was in a stable relationship. Um, like I said, we ended up being together for years. It was a long time. Um, and then he... He, it, it was like 2011, 12, he got into a car accident and he died nine months after that. That's kind of where everything spun out of control. But prior to that, I had already relapsed and was basically a functioning addict and was just, you know, I was still working at the strip club, you know, cocktail waitressing and dancing occasionally. Um, but it was just a secret to everybody. So um, in that, I had met someone who was doing um, like the phone sex. So I was like, oh, I could do that, you know, whatever. And then it kind of segued into oh, you answer phones for an escort agency. Oh, I could do that. And then it was like, oh, um, you know, the guy that ran one of the, well, no, the first place I worked for, it was it was out of state and I would, you know, you'd call and, and this is all why I was in a relationship. I thought, let me just give it a shot. You know, a girl I knew was like, oh, you can make tons of money. You don't even have to do anything. You just go on a dates with them and whatever. You know, go through this place. You know, so I went through the whole whatever process to get on board and it was like I would call and be like hi my name's you know whatever someone would call me back and they're like hi I'm you know Anne and I'm gonna be your booker today and what do you do what are your do's and don'ts and this that the other and then within you know five ten minutes somebody would call like hey go to this address you know you're gonna 
it's gonna be for eight hundred dollars and you know this is what you're gonna do or whatever and then you worked however long you wanted to at the end of whatever you would take they took 60 percent you kept 40 but you would wire them the money so it was totally legit everything was fine um and then I met, and this is, like I said, I was in my relationship till I disclosed everything to, I don't want to say his name, <laughs> but yeah, uh, he knew what was going on. So I thought, well, this is weird, and I really wasn't doing anything um, as far as, like, sex, full sex or whatever. Because um, it was like, you call the shots, and, you know, I would go dance, whatever. <laughs> So, um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, but yeah, so, I don't know. I guess all of that seemed to be okay because I was using and just more lax about everything. Even though, like I said, I was functional user. Nobody really knew. Um, after my significant other had gotten into the car accident is when I kind of like, you know, everything spun out of control. Well, I'm sorry, after he passed away nine months later. And, uh... Like I said, I was estranged from my family, I was estranged from everything, so I found myself out in the streets, nothing, nobody, and at, you know, pretty hefty habit. So I met... Was the issue with your family over the drugs? Mm-hmm. But it was mostly because I pulled away. Um, they, you know, of course were like, where, you know, <laughs> they didn't want me to be out there, but they didn't... I guess nobody really understood what I was going through. I don't even understand what I was going through then, because I didn't want to face loss and all that. Um, Man, I definitely didn't want to face anybody because I was too ashamed. But in that, I was like, well, shit, I have to support myself out here. And I met, um, she ended up being one of the, yeah, she's taught me everything there about the whole industry. But, you know, as far as working in the streets, that's where I started. She showed me everything. Um, but her, her thing was, you know, if you're going to be out, yeah, it's not the greatest, you know, oh, you're not bragging about it, whatever. Most people are going to look down on it, but at least you're not having to rely on anyone else nobody can take anything from you you do what you want and and that's that you know I mean if, if you're gonna be in this lifestyle it is as long as you're safe and you know whatever so I thought okay and and little by little I started and that's how I learned you know like I have my own little rules and stuff like that but that's kind of the whole up and down you know all the ups and downs and stuff that I learned along the way it's like that's how it kind of molds you as far as what you know you can handle what you do what you don't do um, but that, then eventually it was like, wait a minute, you know, I'd see like people posting and stuff like that. I'm like, what am I doing? You know? And that's kind of how, yeah, I said, that's not kind of, that is how I segued into, you know, just taking some pictures and then posting online and being like, okay, well, I'm just going to charge this much and boom, there you go. <laughs> how long did, did you work the streets? Mm -hmm. How long did you work the streets for? Oh, wow. Uh... Probably six, good six years. Six, seven. Yeah, wow. like on and off. There were patches of time where I'd stop, but yeah. And what, when you stopped, what, what was it? Um, when? Well, it would just... Um, no, when you decided to stop in between, what, what was it that got you to stop? Like a bad situation or something? Um, uh, I was in a relationship and things were going, you know, I was I wanted to work like a normal job. And he was like, you know, you don't need to do this anymore. I've got you. Okay, cool. And so I would stop. And then everything was okay for a while until, like, you know, those blues came into the picture. And so then it wasn't the case. So then, you know, I ended up right back into whatever. But like I said, I had, I had that, um, that felony charge hanging over my head from years prior that I had to take care of. So it was like um, when I first, that was from, like, 2014, I think. 2014, I got indicted on it in 2015. On what? Well, it was for organized retail theft. <laughs> organized retail theft. Mm -hmm. That's what I haven't heard of. So. What does that entail? It's um, basically like a glorified shoplifting charge. <laughs> but it's like, you know, when um, you go play, if it's like high dollar items, stuff like that, or, you know, say there's like, I'm trying to think of... Uh, I don't know, people get together and they, they might, you know, rent 
you know, a vehicle to go, like a U-Haul truck or something, to go get these big high high dollar items, and they're going to go return them, and boom, you sell the gift cards and stuff like that. Something like that, for example. Um, but mostly it's just like the high dollar items. I guess once it's over a certain amount, they can call it organized retail theft. So. And how long did you do for that? I, well, when I first got the charge, I was going to court for everything because this was in a different county too. It was in Pinal County. So I was going to court. Everything was fine. Um, when it was time to get sentenced, they said they were going to give me 90 days in the county jail and two years probation. So I thought, okay, fine. When I went to get sentenced, I'm sorry, the day I went to get sentenced, they didn't have me on the docket. So, you know, we checked. I'm like, what's going on? I was like, let's go. I don't want to stay, <laughs> you know? And they're like, we'll be in touch. I was like, okay. This was like June of 2000. 15 maybe yeah and then September of that year I get a, a notice saying that I have a felony warrant to come turn myself in I'm like wait I, and I've never been in trouble like this in my life you know what I mean so I'm like what the hell you know I call they're like yeah come turn yourself in and we'll get this resolved I'm like no I'm not gonna come turn myself in it wasn't my fault like I went to all my court dates I showed up on the day of sentencing you guys are telling me you're overworked underpaid and whatever and you'll be in touch and now you're telling me I have a warrant like no and so I said, screw it. <laughs> and I kind of, I went on the run, I guess you'd call it. <laughs> um, there was some, oh geez. So I, it was 2015. Oh, I can't, I, yeah, I don't know. I can't talk about this. I have, I have a, yeah, I should have thought about that when you asked me before if I could talk about some stuff and not. And um, that was stupid that I <laughs> went into that. Um, I'll do over. Can we start? Don't, don't worry about it. You know what? We keep going. How long did he do? Uh, what are you went for? Well, yeah, no, I, I went on the run or whatever, and then I ended up getting, so all those years, that was another thing, too. I was kind of like living on borrowed time, because I knew eventually I was going to get caught, you know, they're going to catch up with me. It was like 2018, they finally did catch up with me. I did like four months, and then I got out on probation. I did four months in county, Pinal County, and, um, thought it was all said and done, but I didn't realize, okay, probation, okay, I can do this. And I was doing it, everything was fine, until, you know, the drugs came back in again. Um, I ended up violating a couple times, and then finally, that's when I said, um, last year I just revoked it, and they sentenced me to a year, I think I did like a total of almost seven months in prison. So, it was like three months, and then I, I got off on parole, and violated and went back and did another three months. And now it's over, <laughs> so I can close that chapter finally. But it took all those years to get it done. <laughs> yeah, how, how was, talk to me about prison. It was, um, the first time I went was like day camp because I was in an extremely low yard. It was minimum. Um, it was like, whoa, this is prison? Okay, wow. Uh, when I went back, I caught a prison contraband ticket coming in because I had stuff on me that the cops didn't find. But, and they, they take you in your parole violator, they drive you straight back to the prison. So when I got there, um, one of the COs there did find it. So fortunately I didn't get charged with anything, um, but they dealt with it in-house and they charged me with prison contraband. So I got a ticket for it. Well, that class is you like way higher. So yeah, second time I went back, I was on a medium like high yard and it was like, holy shit. I mean, I was there with like lifers, you know, kid killers, baby killers, people killed their husbands, wives. I mean, just, uh, one lady, she killed both her grandkids, her autistic grandsons. Like, I mean, just wow. you sitting right next to you eating whatever. I mean, you can meet murders any day. You don't know. But, like, it was just for some reason it just hit me more that it was, like, a bunch of women. And, like, I don't know. But, yeah. So, I mean, it was I, – I looked out. I had a good bunkie and everything was fine. Um, I was taken care of while I was in there. So it wasn't – I mean, I feel for the people who are there that don't have anybody to look out for them. I mean, I still worked and everything and just the time went by fast. It was not – it was an experience. I don't ever want to go back. I mean, I definitely, my heart goes out to people that are there for years and years. Um, but yeah, it was definitely a learning experience, even at this age. Like, yeah. Like, you know it's someplace you don't want to go, but then you're there and you're like, damn, okay. <laughs> but you got to think with this type of work, you're There's at always a chance. The time. Mm -hmm. And that's what kind of floated back into my head when I said that. So it's like, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm at like the, I'm definitely burnt out. I'm at the tail end of everything. Like basically now it's like, okay, it's my livelihood right now. I'm doing it to survive. There are other things I could stop and do, but it's like, I don't know, uh, little obstacles, I guess. So it's like, I know what I need to do, but 
it's a matter of doing it. <laughs> so once you get out of prison, probation, you're done with everything? Well, I got out, I was on a month of parole. Um, I got out the person that I had been seeing for, oh my God, how many years? It's been some years. Um, we were on off again though. Like we were together solid for the first few years, then we were off again and he ended up meeting this other chick that he got off on those blues or whatever. So he was, yeah. Um, I didn't really mess with them. I didn't want to fuck with them ever. I just saw how they destroyed so many people. But needless to say, I ended up messing with them. And that's when I got out, I did the month of parole, but I was already using again. Um, so, yeah. Um, that led me right back to, okay, well, I need money. Okay, cool. I know what to do. Boom. Started off in the street. Then I was like, I don't even need to be in the street. I can just post, you know, so... Once I had a place or whatever, it was like, okay, take pictures, make a profile, boom. Um, but yeah, it's just like a, I don't know what the word is, but like a revolving door or something. It's just like what you know. It's like you go back to what you know, even though you know it's not right, or there's other things out there. Um, does my family know? No, they don't. Um, I think my sister does from years ago when I did tell her, you know, that's what I had been doing at the time to support myself. But... Yeah, I don't think And what I, was her advice on that, her reaction? She was just like, oh my gosh, like, you know, did anything ever happen? Or weren't you scared? Because she was like, you just get in cars. And I'm like, well, yeah, like, this was, you know, years ago at the time. I just never thought of it. It was just like one of those things you just did. Okay, I need to do this. In order to do that, I got to do this. And then, I mean, she wasn't thrilled, but she's overall like, oh, that's my sister. You know, she's she loves me anyways. <laughs> so, yeah. Um... You still got a relationship with them? Yeah. Thing? Yeah. Um, I'm, I guess I could say I'm a little bit estranged. Just I don't talk to them as often and see them as often as I could and should. But um, my foot's back in the door, so that's <laughs> that's a plus. <laughs> so one day at a time, I guess. I don't know. You She's in another state, though. So. Okay. But she wants me to come out there, which I think would ultimately be the best. <laughs> Probably be... She's a good in idea. Huntington Beach, and it just looks gorgeous there. And it's like, yeah, she's like, you got to get out of Arizona. I don't know. Ever since it, is she is she into anything that you do? No, the drugs. Not, no, uh, <laughs> no, sporting. no. She's got my niece and nephew out there. Um, they're right near the beach. Like it's just yeah, no. Um, she's seen, you know, what I've been through up and down. Not entirely what I've been through, but she knows. Um, but ultimately, she's just like, come out here. Like you, you. I've actually achieved things in my life and lived a normal life and then it was like, like I said, that was nine years I think that I, I didn't touch anything or use and it was like everything was normal. And then it was just, once I relapsed, it just slowly went back and then it was like, not slow, it just boom, you know, ended up at the bottom again and again, so. Did you ever do any kind of rehab? No. Um, I went to detox once and that was, that was it. Um, from what I've learned and stuff, I feel like, I don't know, like a good friend of mine, she just recently went to, she's been through a lot of the same things, but she ended up going to rehab. She just, you know, she wanted to lose her daughter. So she went and, um, you know, she takes methadone, whatever, but it, it seems that it's helped her. I mean, she stayed away from everybody and that's key too, is staying away. Um, I don't care how strong anybody thinks they are. You, when you just quit something, whether if it's a few months or what, you just, you got to stay away from it. You can't go around it. And that's my biggest, you know. You have trouble cutting people off? Um, like the bad influence that you have that kind of like push you back into that? Well, see, I'm, I always say like I'm my own influence. Like I know, but yeah, I mean like there's a couple people where, yeah, it was hard for me to stay away from and they were using, so it's just kind of. You know, and the one is like, well, I don't want you coming around because I don't want you to use. I wanted you to, you know, get your shit back on track and get your life together. Okay, well, yeah, I did too, but I also didn't want to leave that person, you know. So, it is what it is. I don't know. So, your drug of choice is? Um, it was always heroin, but recently, it's now, and I don't even want to call it my drug of choice, but it's just what I'm using now is, are the blues. Um, yeah. What do you get out of that? I saw uh, you take a, some pretty deep hits. And, and what's funny is I don't even, yeah, it's like, I don't, I don't know, at this point it just keeps me to where I'm not sick. Other than that, um, but like I said. sick from withdrawals? Right. 
Yeah, um, I don't have. Other than that, like, I just went, I recently got back on I methadone because I know once my dose is high enough, like, I don't, it's like, I don't know, I don't even want, I don't even think about the stuff. Like, I don't want it. It's like if it fills something in your brain or whatever, fills those receptors so that you don't crave or want it anymore. So it's been like two weeks that I've been back on it. So I'm, you know, slowly, you can only go up so many, you know, milligrams a day and then you have to meet with the doctor each week. So it's my second week now I have to meet with the doctor again. Well, I was supposed to meet with him last week. I got to meet with him again this week before I can go up anymore. So, um, that's kind of part of my plan because <laughs> I don't want to do this forever. And it's like, I'm not getting any younger. I'm at the point where it's, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, this is, this is like a low point for me right now. Big time. <laughs> Are you homeless? Um, I mean, other than staying in motel rooms, yeah. So, um. So you're homeless, but I mean, no apartment, no house, but you have somewhere to right. lay your head at night. Um, I mean, there's two, I have two friends. One, she wants me to move in with her, um, but she uses and stuff, and I just don't foresee it being anything. Another friend, she. She wants me to come stay with her too. I don't know what her place is like. I don't, I know she's okay, but I don't know. I think it's just her that lives there and you know, no drama, no nothing. So um, that could be good. I just wanted to check it out first before I go. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just like, I have places I could go, but. You have bad influences, that's all. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go anywhere where it's going to be the same shit. I'd rather just pick up and leave and go to California, <laughs> you know, so. I don't know. Just got to figure it out. And what's stopping you from going to California? Myself. Uh, just um, that fear of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow. But at least tomorrow would be with my but sister I mean, and my niece that and same nephew. Fear doing right, this exactly. Um, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know what's stopping me because it seems like every all the arrows are pointing there. <laughs> So she's like, oh my gosh, you could have time to heal and get through everything. And the beach is here and yeah, everything. And the beach is a heal. Yeah. She says the same thing all the time. Like she's like, it's so therapeutic, even if, you know, whatever. But she's like, you have so much healing you need to do. And it's all right here. She needs help with the kids. That's, you know, I'd be more than happy to. So I don't know what's stopping me. <laughs> my um, stupidity. So... When you take a call, I mean, tell me about tell me about an experience that you had with somebody. They either got too rough or that you well, felt you, you were in danger. How about that? Oh yeah, when I got out of prison the first time, which was last year, um, I started dabbling around with stuff again because it's like you get out of prison, you go around old haunts or whatever and everybody wants to give you everybody wants to bless you <laughs> with giving you a bunch of you know drugs oh hey you're back here's a 50 pack oh you're back here's an eight ball here's a you know whatever you're like oh cool but you're not thinking oh everybody's trying to get me strung out again so i can be a customer again so anyways um probably like a week a week after you know i'd been up for most of that time which completely shot out strung out already and um Okay, I'll hit the streets, make some money. And some guy drove by, asked if I needed a ride. I got in the car. And I don't just get in the car with anybody, but this is how I knew, like, I must have just been out of my mind. Because once I got in, I sat down and I looked over, and I, I remember he had just, like, this crazy feral look in his eye. And I was like, I just had a, I'm like, shit, this is going to be bad. So I went to set my bag down, and that's when I felt the steel. I never had a gun in my head before until that moment. And I was like frozen like oh my gosh oh my gosh you know and he got really aggressive started screaming a bunch of stuff I I think I was more in shock than anything so I didn't even start crying at first but he pulled in somewhere it was an apartment complex you know I know exactly where but uh I just couldn't believe it was happening and I'm looking at the door like looking at like oh, can I get out but then I'm looking at the size of the gun that's pointed right you know at my head and he's yelling at me tell me what to do and and he'd undone his pants or whatever so he I was at that point I did start crying I was begging him I was telling him I had my period and I was like please don't do this like you know because he's telling me he's gonna uh, what do you say if I suck his dick good enough then then 
he's not gonna, you know, fuck me or whatever. So that's why I was saying, like, I have a tampon in, like, please put a condom on, you know, this, that, the other. So he just grabbed the back of my head and was just, you know, it was, it was bad. It was awful. He was, like, oddly large, so I was, like, literally choking. I think I had actually thrown up. Um, and the whole time with the gun in my head. So he's, you know, yanking my head, whatever, and then he throws me in the seat, passenger seat. And then that's when he's, you know, he wasn't just gonna, whatever he had said was bullshit. He knew he was gonna... And this wasn't his first rodeo. I know the guy's done this before. I could just tell. And I was frozen. I didn't know what to do. You know, like, I talked to a couple people after. They're like, oh, he probably wouldn't have shot you. And I'm like, well, should I have taken that chance? You know, like, whatever. Um, and I might talk about it, so whatever. But it was really terrifying. Um, he, yeah, I was in the seat. And at this point, I mean, everything I had on, it was all ripped. And he forced me to have sex. He did take the tampon out and he'd thrown it out the window, which later would come into play when I brought the cops there. Um, yeah, he forced me to have sex with them and he didn't put a condom on and he finished on my stomach. He didn't realize though as he climbed off of me, I had wiped off of it. There's a hand towel there and I wiped that off and I put it under my shirt because I was like, fuck this guy. Like, I'm, <laughs> I already had it in my head, like I'm gonna get the license plate, I'm gonna fucking call the cops and I have his DNA right here, you know? So, you know, I can't believe after all the years, like, oh my god, I can't fucking believe this. All I could think of was, I didn't want him to do it to somebody else, because it was horrible. So he pretty much, like, started the car, threw me out of the car. I ran back to the room that we had. You know, I'm all ripped up and just a mess. And at first I wanted to just get in the shower, because I just felt so fucking disgust. I was just disgusted. I was mad. I was sad. I was, ugh, pissed at myself, you know, for... And then um, my friend's like, no, 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 you got to call, you know... You're not on, you're not on, you don't have a warrant anymore. You don't, this and that, you can't. And I was like, that's right, I'm calling the cops. Because I had been saying the license plate the whole time. The whole way I ran back, I kept saying it. So I called the cops, they meet me there, and it was just like, oh my God. You know, I'd, I'd had stuff happen before, but I'd never actually gone through this process of it. And was just like, fuck, now I can, now I almost understand why people don't call the cops to report that they've been raped or sexually assaulted. Because it, it just turns into like, almost like where you're the, you know, they're questioning you and this and that. I understand they want to know because for all their different reasons, but it's like, you're like, fuck, I'm the victim here. Like, I just had this happen to me and I feel like you're attacking me. And then you have to go through the rape kit and they're like poking and prodding and just, um, they're usually rough and, or not usually, I mean, I went through it the one time, but the nurses I dealt with were just so like, their bedside manner was horrible. I remember saying to the lady too, like, if this is, you know, if you don't like this job, like, why are you doing this? I mean, granted, I'm sure she makes good money, but I would think you'd have to have some kind of compassion or empathy or something. Sympathy even, but like, yeah, it was the overall whole experience was horrible. Uh, the detective I dealt with, um, at first I was like, oh, bitch. Then I was like, no, she's totally on my side. She's an advocate for me, whatever. But I never heard anything. I mean, I kept in touch with them. Um, over time, you know, I asked, is there anything with the license plate? What about his DNA? I give you a towel with his DNA in it. Like, there has, this guy has to be in the system. You know what I mean? Like, there's no fucking way this is the first time. Even if he was busted for something else. Um, they sent me back, oh, the license plate. It could have been, you know, the situation was traumatic. You need to get the numbers right. Um, you know, the, the testing in the labs takes time. I'm like, well, fuck, it's been months. You know, now it's been... It'll be like a year in... Uh, the beginning of summer or whatever, something like that. Yeah, May, the end of May, June. It's going to be a year. So I'm like, okay, still haven't heard. Like, how long does the, the DNA, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But then again, if he's not in the system, if he's not a felon, it's not going to come up. So it could there could be that. But um, that whole experience in and of itself was just, and I, I feel like I sugarcoated it and didn't say as much, but... Yeah, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. And that right there, it was like, well, fuck, if I hadn't done this... If I hadn't chose to do that to make money, this wouldn't have happened. You know, if I hadn't decided to get in the car, this wouldn't have happened. If I had just, you know, I don't know. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. So. Coulda, shoulda, woulda. Yeah. Do you live with that thought a lot? Um, I didn't at first, but then when I went back to prison as a pro violator and got clean and my mind started to get right, I started to have dreams about it. And then I thought, I wonder if anything's gonna come of that, you know, whatever. And even my bunkie was like, well, maybe maybe they caught him or something and they're gonna come talk to you or whatever. So yeah, um, I don't know why it really bothered me though. Like, and it still does. Um, Cause I want like to know something came of it. Like, I don't know. And know that like he didn't do it to anybody else. So yeah, it does bother me. 
and then it kind of brings up the prior events that have happened. I don't know, it's like that happens and it just, it's like a Rolodex of, you know, different incidences that have happened throughout your life and it brings it all to the surface and you're just like, oh, okay, I gotta shove that back down to that place. <laughs> Yeah. It's always something that lives with you. Thoughts daily. I mean, you think about it all the time. Not daily, but um, sometimes it's there. It just kind of creeps in. So, um, but yeah, I don't like thinking about stuff like that. So then I try to push it down <laughs> so I don't have to. But really, I'm just burying it to where it's going to come out later, <laughs> at a later date with everything else. So I'm looking at you. You're looking pretty, pretty anxious. Yeah. Like, talking about it. Yeah. Like it definitely has had an effect on you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um. You know what? Let's take two, take a breath, and uh, we'll come back. Okay. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Let me shut this shit off. <laughs>